So the larger movement, I, you know, uh, we talked about both food systems, community food systems. The, you know, of course the markets are part of a larger movement than even that. We're not just a foods movement. We're of course a social movement around uh, wealth and around uh, planning and around public space, uh, you know, environmental degradation. There's so many things we're talking about. We're not just talking about the distribution of food, but that is the core of it. This, uh, this, this, this diagram, I don't know if any of you have seen this. I saw this at Kellogg Food and Society a number of years ago, and it struck me as being so important that I, that I went. And, first I stole it, then I called them and said, can I use this? And they said, sure. Uh, not willing, and I should probably ask. And this is a Burkana Institute. Uh, so this is Deborah Fries and uh, Meg Wheatley. I mean, Meg Wheatley, a great author around movement. She works on movements and around the idea of how movements uh, coalesce, how they become movements, and she can describe the steps of a movement, and that's what's so great about what she's doing. It's really quite an uh, understandable number of steps. But Deborah said to us, look, I want you as organizers to feel comfortable about what you're doing and make sure that you understand how you fit into this whole thing, your food system work you're doing. So Kellogg, her, kind of, I thought it was nice, it was more nice of Kellogg to do this for us. So basically, as you can tell, there are two, there are two um, graphs at one time. The upper graph is the, is the dominant paradigm that exists in anything at any place at any one time. For us, we may call that the industrial food system. That exists, it's growing, it's happening, it's happening all the time around us. And people often think, as you know, that we're trying to take over that food system. We're kind of right, we're on it, trying to take it apart and work against it. And what Deborah and Meg showed me really is we're talking about we're building a completely different system that operates at the same time. And it's just two separate movements, two systems happening at the same time. So the bottom, the emerging one, is the alternative food system, if you will. And what this helped me to see, and she said, you know, at different points, actors from the dominant will come to the alternative system and will see it when they're, you know, the issue that occurs to them. You, you know, these two systems may exist for a long time at the same time. It's not going to, it's not, it may never topple. One may never topple the other. But the point is choice. The point is opportunity. The point is alternative and innovation happens. And really, the question is, where are we? Well, we're probably near the beginning of the bottom. But as you, if you've been in the system at any length of time, the alternative food system, the community food system, you have felt the, all of a sudden, sort of the way that the media has somehow found us, ooh, all of a sudden, you know, kind of all of a sudden. And all of things like, uh, all of a sudden, there's people saying, we should have this. Every city you go to now, there's a local food system movement. Every city you go to, every region. It certainly wasn't the case five years ago. I certainly think that uh, Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, I know when Omnivore's Dilemma came out, I read it, and I was like, oh, OK, that's good. And then I went to a party, and these people were like, did you read this book? <laughs> and they were quoting it. And I said, well, we said, yeah, I told you that two years ago. But I guess I'm not a Michael Pollan. Yeah, you know, he's a better writer. So it's true. I realized, oh, yeah, he's a, this is a moment in that system. He added something. He explained it in a way to people that were not in the system that I did not explain it. And in a moment when people were ready to hear it, a certain amount of people were ready to hear it. Certainly our first lady's um, championing of local food has been an extraordinary moment for us. And the way that she's adopted it into, I find, what I find so eloquent about her story is that she talks about it from a personal standpoint. That she as a, a mother and as a, as a working woman now realized that she wasn't necessarily thinking about food in such an important way. Now she does. And she said, yeah, I'm lucky. Me and my husband, we basically work at home. So it's nice. But you know, that little garden they put in, uh, you know, as you may, many of you may know, Alice Waters uh, was a, a part of the uh, reason why that happened. She worked um, to get a garden. She worked, she tried to, to get the Clintons to do a garden and was uns unsuccessful in that. And so it tells you, it's not like it just happens. There are actors happening behind the scenes, and for Michelle Obama, for some, because maybe because she had two such small uh, young daughters, um, she saw it as an important piece for her. And of course, she's been an amazing, at the same time, we're still battling policy at the, at the federal level sometimes. We do have this champion, and of course, 
Um, you know, we've seen a great amount of change in her and, you know, the farmer's market at the White House. Interestingly, when they opened that farmer's market at the White House, for a long time it was the number one food stamp market for that organization. All the many markets that these the fresh farms ran, the White House market, what had the most food stamps, uh, interestingly. So the context of that, the great movement, figuring how you work within that is very important. But also the period of time, right? So we're talking about, like I said to you, why and why are markets important in this in this piece of it? Well, you know, this has occurs to me again and again as I see all these other incredibly good points of uh, entry of opening up farm to school and food hubs and community gardens and uh, school gardens. All of these are extremely important. And so I ask myself, uh, well, what is it that farmers markets do in relationship to those? Well, the truth is. And I'll say this in many rooms and many times to many people, I have yet to find another uh, strategy that allows the behavior change to happen over a long period of time like a farmer's market. So like a farmer coming into our system, if you run a farmer's market, you've seen it. You've seen a farmer come in, uh, grow what they grow, go home, over a period of time change dramatically. And how they grow, how they interact with this, how they interact with their shoppers. Maybe they become bolder about selling to wholesale entities or whoever. I think of the farmers I was talking about earlier who did the, who's doing, who I just wrote about, who are doing arugula flowers at the market this Tuesday. And this is a, a farmer who, when I mean, they came to us, maybe 11, 12 years ago, maybe a little longer, they were they were called. Monica's Okra World. They sold okra. They sold it <laughs> raw and they sold it cut. They sold a little bit of greens and that's it. You went and saw the market, them at the market today. Their table, they actually have two spaces now and the mother and the daughter and the husband take, have just an extraordinary amount of different products at that table. Maybe at any one time, at any day of market, anywhere from 40 to 60 different products at the table. And everything from squash blossoms to greens to, you know, to onions. And they're actually anchoring other markets now. They're working with me in a, in, a, in a food desert of New Orleans and anchoring it as the raw fruit and vegetable vendor. And they're not making any money yet. And they're okay with that. They're willing to work with that. That that farmer is willing to do that. And I can think of how many years I've been working with them and how much they've taught me and how much I've taught them and how we've grown together. I realized that that's the, one of the great things about farmers markets. We have the time, the many seasons, to think about how we're growing a shopper. You know, you think about new shoppers, and this is a great point around the whole food stamp issues as well. How long does it take to grow a new shopper? You know, you watch a shopper come in the market, and you know, they come in and you watch them, and they're not sure why they're there. They've heard about it, they've got an hour. They look around, they kind of stand in the middle of the, of the, the um, Aisle, they don't go near the tables, they really don't make eye contact, they finally see something they know. Maybe they see somebody selling um, something that's valuable <coughs> but they recognize. And they walk up and you watch them hesitantly look at the farmer. And if the farmer's on their game and realizes that it's good at new shoppers, they're, hey, how are you? And they explain it and the person buys it and they go off. And then you might see them in a week or two and you see them come back and often they'll go back to that same farmer first and often that farmer will be like, hey, good to see you, how was that? And that, oof, that changes lots of things right there. And then they start, yeah, it was good, I really liked it, you know, and then they buy something else. And, and you actually watch farmer, a uh, shopper evolve themselves from someone who will buy a couple things that they know to really, a time, you know, finding the farmers that they really respond to and, and, and picking out different items. And then what do you see? You see them buying starter plants, and you see them, you hear they're growing food, and you see them working on other projects. And you're watching the evolution of a shopper, and you know it happens over a long period of time. And every time they come to the market, if you're doing it right, you're adding something to it so they can walk away going, well, that was really useful. Sometimes you lose them for a month or two months or six months, and they don't come back, and then you have to start over again. Or maybe that first interaction wasn't so good. So there's a lot of reasons why it takes so long for us to do what we do. And the same is true of farmers, the same is true of neighbors as well. So the idea of the length of time that a farmer's market can work with all of those different audiences they have and how they impact them with those capitals is also very important to think about and what you should measure. Measure over a period of seasons. I love every 
every market in the, in the country to tell me how many shoppers they can have on a regular basis to actually click their shoppers. We're very far from that. To me, that just, it has to be done. Markets have got to know how many shoppers they average on a weekly basis, and you'd be amazed how many, I have no idea, I'm just guessing. Secondly, I think what we have to figure out is who is our, who is the core shopper, who is the core farmer, who are the core, you know, what is the core activity of your market, what is your culture, and then I think you can expand it from there. So I think you have to really sit down and think about, you know, who is it, it, it we used to sit around a lot, and uh, when our founder would be at the market, he'd come to the market, he would stand next to me, you know, just to figure out some way to manage me, and he'd say, who's not here, who's not here? And, I, you know, it used to me crazy, but he's right. It, was all, it became this, this joke we'd always make about we hadn't seen a certain kind of person for a few weeks or months or something. And we said, yeah, you know, we really lost that demographic. Let's do a marketing campaign to reclaim it. Like, we haven't seen the mom with that one mom with the kids that used to come with her friends. Where have they been lately? Let's actually, maybe we should do a campaign for that. So that's part of it, too, is thinking about bringing people back in. That's a great market to do as well. So this is a picture of uh, the Toronto, uh, city of Toronto, a brilliant, brilliant food share. I mean, just I went up there to work with Toronto recently in Greenbelt Farmers Markets and um, really kind of, you know, humbled by the, the breadth of knowledge, of course, people like Wayne Roberts and people like that out there, you know, surprised. Uh, but the Toronto food share people are really thinking about it as a system. And so, you can find this on their site. It's a picture of the city of Toronto, the region, actually. And they're talking about how their impact is on the cross, and that's food share. They also need markets as well, as you may know. And, you know, even with this, even this, this is basically what they're doing. What would be great is to see a um, same map of what they're going to do, what they haven't done, who haven't they got to. And, of course, knowing Debbie Field, she's thinking about that. But that's a great way, a visual of it, something that really says to your community, look, we're not just here to make sure things are happening right now, but what's the big idea with our market? What are we really after? And I think that kind of visual is a great way to look at it. So what's next, and who's next, and so who's not here? A lot of times I'm asked to talk about what are the trends of what the markets are about. I think there are a lot of audiences we know that we know we haven't reached yet, and we're going to have to reach. I think of, you know, of course for me, disaster recovery, uh, working in New York and Vermont a lot, we talk about it a lot, you know, the resiliency of our food system. In New Orleans, uh, post Hurricane Katrina, we reopened our markets November 22nd, 2005. Uh, of course, August 29, 2005 was when the uh, levees broke. And uh, we did that because our slow food leader was literally yelling at us on a daily basis to get reopened. She thought we should be open by October. Because our farmers actually were not affected so much because they were outside the uh, levee system. They were, of course, north of the lake. And they needed places to sell, so we did need to get back pretty quickly because there was no else for them to sell food but at a farmer's market. There were uh, no grocery stores open when we opened the farmer's market. There were no grocery stores open. There were communities, entire parts of the city, that didn't, that had, I mean, we did a food map of the whole city. There were parts of the food system. Uh, one neighbor called Gentilly that had one Wings restaurant open within five miles, all dark around them. They were open, they were trying to do what they could do for their community, but that's all that was open. You know, of course the corporate um, retail took a lot longer to come back um, and talked a lot about their, you know, how hard it was for them and just didn't have the money and had to do a lot of cleaning. And, you know, the corner store is open and the farmer's market opened and I remember that day, Obviously, I'll never forget that day, November 22nd, 2005, because it was a moment of great joy. Um, and it was thousands of people coming. Many of them weren't even going to buy food, but they did not buy food. They just wanted to come to a place that was happy and normal, and they just wanted to feel better. And they came, they kept coming, they kept coming. That was the Tuesday market that we reopened. And, um, you know, it showed us. Uh, how resilient we could be, although certainly we, we now know more about what we need to do to make it more resilient. And then of course the oil spill after that, um, we realized again other things we needed to do to make it more resilient. And that's true in Vermont and in New York and other states that are going through disaster after disaster. They're thinking about how they can be resilient. That is certainly an issue that we at Farmers Market should focus on. 